Let me begin by thanking CIFAR for sponsoring these world-class researchers here and in the rest of the room and elsewhere, the three centers, Amy, Mila, and Vector, and this great workshop. I also want to give a long overdue thanks to Mila for funding me in 1985 when I came to Toronto to work as a postdoc way, way back when. That's me. <clears throat> Let me begin, as usual, by asking the panelists to say a few words about themselves and about their research. And maybe go in this order. Hi, um, I'm Audrey Durand. I have joined uh, Université Laval as an assistant professor in July, and I'm affiliated with Mila. Um, I've been working at the intersection of computer science and health since about 10 years. Uh, in fact, when I was a master's student, I used to develop computer simulation software to help decision makers in public health to evaluate and compare different prevention and treatment strategies that could be applied to a population. And eventually, as I was doing this, uh, I thought, I mean, it, it's nice to evaluate expert strategies, but what if we could find an optimal strategy for given a specific population? And so I started drifting towards machine learning, more specifically towards reinforcement learning, which is now my field of research, uh, with an important focus on the multi-arm bandit setting. And um, yeah, so this is my, more like my theoretical work. And I like to tackle challenges that are motivated by applications such as design of experiments, like what we find in clinical trials. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Stock, and I have a background in uh, computer science and medicine. And I work as a neuroscientist for almost 10 years now. Um, the general theme of the work on my team is to uh, embrace the emerging large data sets uh, in the brain sciences, which is since recently only kind of a big data science. We try to um, find kind of innovative modeling solutions to re revisit some of these classical questions like sex differences in the brain exist or not, and then <coughs> translate uh, 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 these new findings back into the application domain. So, and this bridging of medicine and computer science uh, previously was manifested in uh, working as faculty in, 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 at the Faculty of Medicine in Germany, but also at Inria Sackley in France. And I'm happy uh, since November 1st to uh, uh, now be faculty at McGill's Faculty of Medicine, as well as associate uh, member of MILA. Hi, uh, my name is Anna Goldenberg. I am um, professor? a professor. Um, uh, yeah, so um, I am actually a senior scientist at the Children's Hospital in Toronto. Um, I'm also an associate professor in the computer science department, and I'm a, a vector faculty and associate uh, research director of health at Vector. Um, my uh, field of interest spans everything that's possible around healthcare, probably, including RL most recently. But um, we started uh, thinking about the complex diseases from the biological standpoint. So I've done a lot of work in kind of data integration to understand the complexity of human diseases. But most recently, I've been working on trying to figure out how to build machine learning models that we can implement in uh, healthcare back at the hospital. And towards that extent, I'm now co-chairing an AI and medicine initiative at the pediatric hospital where um, we are really trying to understand what will it take to implement uh, the systems and um, trying to be reasonable about that. Hello, my name is Tal Arbel. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering at McGill University and associate member of MILA. Um, my research is really at the intersection between machine learning, computer vision, and medical image analysis. So my background is in computer vision um, in terms of grad school, and, um, but my research program has been focused a lot on probabilistic methods in medical image analysis um, for many, many years with a lot of applications within the domains of neurology and neurosurgery. So this includes probabilistic graphical models, Bayesian methods, and recently a lot of interest in Bayesian deep learning. 
Um, my research focus has really been on trying to develop methods that have clinical impact. Uh, I've worked for many years in the area of building probabilistic graphical models and deep learning models for things like segmenting and detecting lesions and tumors um, from patient brain images, uh, patients with multiple sclerosis and other neurodegenerative diseases and brain tumors. Um, recently, I've worked a lot on uncertainty in deep learning, so that's very important if we want to integrate deep learning models in the clinic. So um, I'm looking at models of uncertainty and also propagating uncertainty along different inference tasks, which is very common in medical image analysis. Um, and recently, I've been becoming very much more excited about these new projects where I'm looking at um, deep learning models for predicting uh, future disease progression um, and, uh, and also determining uh, responders to treatment and, and looking at temporal evolution of disease and trying to determine sort of uh, metrics to, um, to determine if a clinical trial is working or not working and moving towards precision medicine based at least partially on medical images like MRI. Hi, uh, my name is Irina Risch. I just recently joined Mila and uh, University of Montreal as associate professor. Uh, I was previously at IBM TJ Watson in Yorktown, New York for many years and I work, worked there on both sides of the yin-yang kind of relationship between neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Uh, the direction from artificial intelligence to neuroscience basically focused on applying machine learning, statistical analysis tools to um, detect, discover statistical biomarkers of different mental disorders, such as schizophrenia, joint work with RAS, which gained quite a bit of traction recently. Also, chronic pain, cocaine addiction, and uh, pretty much many other disorders, also including not psychiatric, but rather uh, neurological, like Huntington disease, and so on and so forth. Then more recently, we were moving from analysis of brain imaging data such as functional MRI and EEG towards uh, beyond the scanner data such as text, speech, wearable devices, uh, video, all kind of relatively cheap data you can collect about uh, a person which can be informative about person mental state and this is really I think exciting area of research because it's much more practical you don't have to put person in a scanner you can potentially design an app your personal guardian angel or personal psychiatrist or personal therapist or just a friend call it whatever see movie her but you get the idea yeah. so it can track your signals track your mental states and perhaps call for help when needed tell a joke when the person is falling to depression. Applications are many. So it's just kind of one of the areas of um, AI for neuro and psychiatry uh, that I'm kind of currently focused on. There are many other topics uh, in the opposite direction which involve focusing on core AI and going along the direction from current narrow AI as we understand it, AI that can be trained on fixed data set uh, to do really well on particular task, like play Go, or translate from language to language, or detect image, I mean, uh, diagnose something from MRI imaging. Towards human level AI, which is a, quite a big leap, but I believe that on the way from narrow to human level, uh, it would be useful to go through broad AI. By broad AI, I and other people mean essentially continual lifelong learning. Uh, making AI systems learn continually uh, to perform different tasks. So you would have versatile AI that can one day learn how to play Go, next day how to translate from English to French, which I still have to work on, and then can diagnose stuff from images and so on and so forth. So this is um, kind of AI focus where neuroscience hopefully can provide various inspirations such as stability versus plasticity, uh, knowledge, you know, and so on and so forth. Thank you. <coughs> okay, okay well, bonjour à tous. C'est un grand plaisir et un honneur d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Um, so my name is Martin Vallière. I come from a background of uh, medical physics. Uh, I worked in uh, research 
in, the, in radiotherapy departments basically s since my graduate studies. Um, and really, now I'm moving towards uh, Sherbrooke University in the computer <coughs> science department, but still affiliated to the hospital. Um, and now I'm, I'll be affiliated with Mila. Um, <clears throat> so, so during my graduate studies, basically uh, the work that we've done was concentrated on precision oncology, building predictive models to find the best treatment for each individual, individual patient, the right, right treatment at the right time, basically. So I've been building predictive models in cancer. Uh, when the, the treatment decision comes, there's many var variables to consider. Basically, there's imaging that can inform us, but there's genomics, uh, demographics, text reports. There's many different types of information that can come into play. I've been focusing on medical imaging most of all during my graduate studies, given that normally most tum tumors that are more aggressiveness normally uh, tend to have a more heterogeneous patterns and heterogeneity uh, inside the tumor, intratumoral heterogeneity, so we can capture that with, uh, medical, with uh, different quantitative image analysis. I've been building models with that to uh, predict tumor aggressiveness, basically. And uh, now I'm going towards more uh, integrating different types of omics data together, including medical imaging, radiomics, so genomics, all that together, and uh, also uh, considering the, the whole flow of uh, data source in, uh, in the electronic health record system, basically, to build predictive models. Thank you very much. What a wonderful, diverse group of people with good skill sets. First question I want to pose is, what is the most exciting advance and a machine, uh, applying machine learning to healthcare over the last few years. There's been a lot of exciting things here, but what do you think is the number one thing? Go. Any volunteers? Uh, well, by definition, my answer will be very subjective because I only can judge from what I know about. Okay. But I find it extremely exciting, this whole raising like, field of computational psychiatry yes. that you know well about. And particularly, as I mentioned, uh, computational psychiatry uh, uh, beyond the scanner. So text analysis, for example, of interviews with psychiatric mm. patients that can reveal a few years in advance which of the prodromal patients can actually develop psychotic episode. And doing that just from transcribed text with close to 100% accuracy is quite exciting, I would say. And there are many, many other examples of text and speech analysis which can very accurately uh, detect and or predict development of certain mental conditions, anything from addiction to depression and so on and so forth. And I think this is a quickly growing field and this is, I think, very useful and very exciting to me. I agree. Other people? Yes. Um, I'm just going to say, um, actually, data. So uh, mm -hmm. in the brain sciences, uh, at least, if you look at psychiatry, neuro neurology, neurosurgery, the reality is that uh, even consortia data sets that were acquired over, over years uh, by confederated efforts, you rarely exceed data from 1,000 people. Mm -hmm. So that's just the reality. It's just very hard to acquire these types of data, and we are very far away from internet-scale data in these pockets. So, and, but since we have always richer data sets from always more people, like genetics, brain imaging, and so on, much vaster spaces of the landscape of modeling tools actually become accessible for the first place, uh, in the first place. So, and I think this is a very important kind of watershed event. Good, I agree completely. Other comments? Sure. Um, I don't know, I think uh, it's hard to come up with just one. Uh, right, for you too. It's uh, one top. Uh, because we, I mean, the reason why we are here, I guess, is because we are excitable by a lot of different things. Um, I'm kind of very excited by the direction of the counterfactual modeling in healthcare. Um, there's been a lot more of it, so counterfactual modeling, causality, is a bit less advanced, I would say, in, in that space, but there has uh, started being some real uh, modeling advances in that space, and we really need it in healthcare. Um, even though we can do well with predictive modeling, there are other types of questions that are harder to answer. There are some very interesting, so I'll, I'll just list the top 20 and then. Um, but uh, I think uh, 
there are some really nice methods about irregularly sampled and missing data. So there are models that are starting to really model real data as opposed to uh, you know, making an assumption that uh, everything is measured regularly like uh, mm -hmm. RNNs and that, um, or that the, the difference between the time points where they are measured are not important. Um, I'm going to stop for now okay. let others. You have more chances. Other comments? Personally, I'm pretty excited with what uh, natural language processing can do with uh, medical text reports. Uh, what I was during my postdoctoral training in San Francisco, I worked with a team and we, we, we uh, basically assessed survivorship, long-term survivors, short-term survivors with just medical notes and it was pretty interesting mm -hmm. to see that what can be done and uh, that Usually post-analysis, after building those NLP models, you can go back and see which words are important for survivorship. And for different types of cancer, there's different mutations that can come out, but there's also, also social factors that came out out of those post-analyses that I found very interesting, like we can imagine depression, maybe an important word that came out out of those analyses, depression, divorce, things like that. So I think it's really important, uh, really interesting, NLP, with medical text reports. Well, I would say that all the work that has been done in representation learning in general, allowing to work with data that is complex, which is the kind of data that we have to work with in the field of healthcare, has been helping a lot. Good. So yeah, I just want to say, um, for me, uh, it's taken a while for deep learning to enter the field of medical image analysis for a variety of reasons, one of which is the data, but for a variety of other reasons. So we're starting to see um, deep learning models enter medical image analysis, and we're starting to understand that the problems of medical image analysis are very different than computer vision. Mm -hmm. And so things that worked in computer vision work for some applications in medical imaging, but there are many of them where they don't. So this provides an opportunity for people in machine learning to start to say, hey, uh, I, maybe I'll collaborate with you, you've got all this interesting data, and now we have advances in machine learning that are spawned by medical imaging. So you see in our conferences that we go to, you know, I typically go to Mackay and Middle and those, much more machine learning, but innovative machine learning, where you have these collaborations where people are starting to go, oh yeah, you have this other data set, most data sets are small, let's look into transfer learning, domain adaptation, meta-learning, and, and all of these um, really interesting uh, sort of machine learning models that need adaptation, need innovation. And so it's actually exciting in, in that um, with these two fields working together, I think that now we can um, have innovations in, in both theoretical models, but also actually have impact in healthcare. It's interesting. I'm working on all these different projects. <laughs> so it's nice to hear reinforcement for my things I've been working on. Next question. So how is machine learning and AI in general changing the practice of healthcare? Or is it first? But I think the answer is yes. Um, I don't think it's changing the practice much yet. Okay. Um, I think there is a potential uh, that, that's out there. There are several systems that have been implemented in, in practice. I think as machine learners, we don't um, necessarily anticipate the kind of things that will bring the algorithms down, right? We focus on the, on the method and methodology, try to perfect that. But things that can change are the underlying electronic medical record system where they've recorded or stopped collecting whatever data they were mm -hmm. collecting before yeah. and now collecting something else entirely. Um, and somehow they don't notify in advance uh, yeah. the algorithms or the people that w would care to have to rebuild stuff. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of hope uh, on both sides. I think the way that it will change is prevention. I'm hoping yes. that yeah. machine learning's role in healthcare is to prevent a lot of critical events or forecast, predict, and not let uh, critical events or even uh, disease to change the disease trajectory for the better uh, intervention will will play a, a great role uh, in this space but we're just starting on that path I think good yes um, I just want to add that yes uh, if we work in our own little silos we will not make impact in, in clinical care but I, I think that for those people that are working on machine learning models, um, if we can have collaborations with clinicians um, mm -hmm. and in real clinical problems as we develop our methods, then we will be able to 
have impact. And so uh, that's the key, is not to do, you know, sort of have machine learning models and then translate them. Mm -hmm. I think we need to work together. So a happy um, Canadian story is that we have worked, my group has worked in collaboration with machine learning researchers uh, like Doina Precup and so on at mm -hmm. Mila, and also um, with people at the Montreal Neurological Institute and clinicians as well as industry and medical industry um, has been instrumental in, in, in what we've been working on. So we work, we have collaborations with a company called NeuroRx. They develop software analysis tools for the pharmaceutical industry for pretty much all MS drugs that have, are developed in the world. And so with um, data that they have provided us with manual segmentations of lesions, we have developed techniques and worked with them through NSERC, uh, through an NSERC CRD, worked regularly with them to develop new probabilistic models, um, graphical models, in fact, and then deep learning models, to be able to detect lesions, which are endpoints for clinical trials. And our software system are, have been embedded into the software analysis pipeline at, at NeuroRx. So pretty much, not only does that speed up their um, process, but pretty much all the multiple sclerosis, new multiple sclerosis drugs out there in the world have been um, developed using software that we have developed as, as an interdisciplinary. That's exciting. Yes. So um, my perspective is that um, there's a lot of uh, excitement for and, and kind of need for uh, precision medicine. So stakeholders, policymakers, funding agencies, they really want to invest into this. But um, when I read these, these grants and, and, and the papers, I'm wondering, um, so how are we exactly going to go from group averages where we give medication that is good for people on average yes. to uh, kind of a different uh, granularity where medical decision making is really based uh, on a, a single person's profile. So and I think uh, what would be a useful reflection in this direction is to really uh, identify milestones on the way there. So what could actually be actionable and possible, let's say, in the space of three to five years. Because um, now there's a lot of funding in, in this direction, but if you have nothing to show uh, in five years from now, it's like we need to identify some low-hanging fruits, if you will, and uh, to keep the funding coming. I mean, there have been some deployed systems, but not that many. Uh, okay, so um, again, I can only speak from my own experience and what I've kind of learned so far. I, I would say that probably machine learning is changing healthcare already and not just in the future. Uh, well, I would say both. There are various studies in machine learning applications to healthcare which probably only going to be adopted in the future or may just pave the way to the future. For example, functional MRI analysis I'm not sure it's very likely to become widely adopted in medical practice ever. It's a good tool for like academic research, but you need more practical uh, sensors that can change medical practice. On the other hand, uh, machine learning applications to imaging that achieve like uh, superhuman accuracy on MRI and various other types of measurements, I think they are being already practical and as Anna mentioned, I actually would just want to second this opinion, the uh, trend towards prevention. Yes. Yes, I think it's an important one and I think machine learning really can help there and it's already helping. One example is a project we're kind of about to start with collaborators from medical school. Um, instead of doing um, um, some more invasive testing, for example, of liver, you can try to see if you can accurately detect certain disorders from uh, just simple sonogram. Yeah. That's much, much cheaper, much easier. And if you can use uh, sophisticated enough machine learning to be accurate with diagnosis, you can do early prevention. And that's very practical. Yeah. yeah. And I think there are many examples where uh, application of machine learning and imaging does help already. But there are many examples where there is much more work to be done. We're not done. I agree with it, but I agree also with the, 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 the statement that said that it's not 
changing routine clinical practice yet as much as it should. Uh, I think AI is going fast. AI methods, the development of those methods is going faster than us, uh, that, than us getting access to the data, basically. If we, uh, personally, I feel like I've been overfitting since 2011, you know, with different data sets that, that, that we analyze. So I think we need to get better at analyzing historical data that is already in our hospitals, getting access to data. that so that we can then learn how to build uh, strong models that can have an impact right now before thinking of uh, getting access to new data that will come in to reinforce what we've learned. So okay. let's get the data first. Well, on top of this, I would add that I don't think that machine learning is going to change health by replacing the medical experts, yes. more like providing them with companions and helping them by digesting information that the medical experts cannot process themselves. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Like a better microscope. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've already touched on some of these, but the next question is, what is the biggest challenges now? We've already touched about some of the issues, but can you maybe elaborate? Observational data, <coughs> uh, limited amount of data, uh, educating our colleagues. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, well, Thank you for almost providing an answer sorry, to your own sorry, question. Sorry. I'm looking at my notes. It makes our job much easier. Yeah. So all I have to do is just to elaborate on that particular topic. But yes, I think uh, improving communication across different fields is always a tough thing to do. And more needs to be done. And we just had a few weeks ago actually another conference, uh, Maine, Montreal AI and Neuroscience Conference. Oh. Um, at the University of Montreal, it's, uh, I think, sort of fourth year in a row. Um, and this was a question for the panel, how do we design uh, new programs for students mm -hmm. who are in medical school, in psychology, in psychiatry, in neuroscience, and students in computer science? How do we kind of uh, connect them better? Because they need to not only speak the same language, they need to have a kind of common set of skills, common set of knowledge. How do we do that? It's a tough question, but uh, what I suggested there, and I guess I will just repeat it here, I think it's a job of the professors working at the intersection of um, <coughs> multiple fields to design new courses yep. that will be specifically tailored for kind of cross-disciplinary research. So you only teach to medical students, to students in psychiatry and psychology department, uh, that part of math and machine learning that actually going to be useful for them, so they not get bored and they will not ask questions like why they're learning that. Because I think it's very difficult to learn anything if you don't have a good answer to question why you're doing that. And grade is not really a very motivating question, yeah. I mean, answer. The same thing for computer scientists. I think there is so much to learn from other disciplines, from biology, from mm -hmm. uh, neuroscience, from psychology, psychiatry, from physics, from philosophy, because people have been thinking about intelligence and what does it mean and how mind works, mind and brain, for at least a few thousand of years <laughs> in multiple disciplines. And oh, by the way, I didn't mention art. And literature so it's a quite inter interdisciplinary area and yet computer scientists seems to be a kind of a little bit um, tunnel vision sometimes I don't want to offend anyone and I'm also talking about myself so I'm That's just kind fine. of right now starting to explore interdisciplinary topics but I think that people in machine learning AI and computer science in general would really benefit from new courses, which are interdisciplinary, and they address from different perspectives the questions that computer scientists ask. It's good you're volunteering to teach. The a question few is, of them. who going to develop the courses? I know. Um, yeah, so I fully agree with this. Uh, um, I would kind of even say I think it's a, a science sociological issue or an education issue. Um, I mean, it's hard enough to go through five years of computer science or like five, six years of medicine and. But then the question is, uh, how do you actually uh, identify people for like interdisciplinary programs as uh, you suggest, like how, does, how do we know that somebody who just comes out of school 
can adopt the thought style of biology, the thought style of computer science or probabilistic thinking and statistics. We need like a very careful admission procedures to do this on top and above and beyond uh, redesigning these curricula, which is also hard because we need to cut something out. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's not exactly clear how to reconcile all these things. I, I don't think it's a problem. We don't really have to get more selective. I think uh, people coming to program, uh, they, in any case, starting almost from scratch. So I think the main prerequisite will be passion about the subject. And then it's a job of a professor to teach well. Okay. Yeah. Other comments? So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I think there are immediate challenges, and then there are the long-term challenges. The education, I would say, is a long-term challenge. Yes. And uh, in Canada, <coughs> it's fortunately changing. I don't know how long it'll take, but. Um, uh, I'm sitting, uh, and Osmo right there, we are sitting on a, um, uh, the task force for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons mm -hmm. where they're trying to change the curriculum for the mm -hmm. clinicians to incorporate digital awareness. Uh, we've been trying to define it a little bit better, but uh, basically it's, uh, to me, it means that the doctors will start understanding uncertainty a little better. That would help. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think the shorter term ch challenges are definitely data. There is access to data right now for uh, broadly is, is not, it's not good. It's not there at all. And we're talking about generalizable models. We're talking about, well, I'm build, building something. It'll work at my hospital. Will it work at another hospital? We have mm -hmm. no idea because there is no real path path to, to try it in any other place. And, you know, the DTAs and whatever, the, all of the bureaucratic stuff that we are now engaged in, it takes months. All of my students, none of my students have patients. I frankly don't have patients for them. Both types of patients, right? So there is, yeah, there is, and uh, we are trying, we are trying to make it better. Um, at Vector, we are working on the new data trust strategy, but uh, much more needs to be done, and globally, uh, to, to, to provide that data access. I think it's one of the, the biggest uh, Im impediments to making it much more impactful. So in Alberta, we do have very stiff access to various data sets, but they tend to be observational data, not, R not RCT data, which is another set of challenges. But, but I'm happy with observational data. Um, okay, <laughs> let's talk after. Yes. Um, because of the lack of data, we have, especially in medical imaging, these challenges, sort of like yes, Kegel, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but for True. medical imaging. So we have, you know, uh, the BRATS, BRATS and all kinds of interesting challenges in association with our conferences. And these challenges um, are very helpful because people don't have data. So a lot of people try to win these challenges. And so I think one of the biggest things that we have to worry about is is to remember um, to design our metrics in such a way that they have clinical impact. So a lot of the times people have these challenges and then they use traditional computer vision metrics yeah, yeah. and everyone's fighting to, to win the challenge. And um, sometimes the metrics are not in line with any clinical need. And so we have a whole bunch of people in the field working really hard on problems that may not ever be important or of interest in a real clinical domain. So I think there's a responsibility to, to focus the challenges on the metrics of interest to a specific clinical task and to make sure that it's in line with that task. Yeah, I actually completely agree with that. And to continue and somewhat kind of change the direction of that and also to answer uh, the um, problem raised by Anna. So on one hand, yes, we need to continue uh, working on getting more data. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we can also try to work with what we've got. And the question of working with relatively small data, actually it's kind of, well, you could say plagued the new imaging field for a long time and perhaps other medical fields. But it doesn't mean that uh, there is nothing we can do. First of all, we have to be very creative and open-minded about machine learning methodologies that we use. For example, if particular methodology is very data-hungry, it doesn't mean they'll have to use it. You yeah. probably know what I'm hinting at. Yes, and yes, yes. Yoshio is not in the room. <laughs> well, <laughs> He's not well, No, actually, he completely agrees with that. Basically, yes. you use 
what works, and you combine it with prior. And I think one uh, clear way to deal with a uh, uh, scarce data issue sometimes, if there is nothing else you could do, is to use prior, which means you need to work with an expert in the domain and try to understand better what's known in the field, and you try to encode it as prior into your models. And sometimes priors, as simple as good old sparsity, L1, yes. can actually help you fit a model with 80,000 variables, say voxels in MRI, yeah, fMRI, yeah. and about 40 subjects, and it will generalize. And you do not use deep learning, you use sparse <laughs> regression. Yeah. And that's okay. So basically in medical field, I think it depends, yeah, you need to have your priorities straight. Do you want to solve the problem or you want to have a next NIPS paper? You need to choose. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well said, okay. well said. Uh, just to finish on the, the data problem, then we, I guess we can move on. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah very importantly, we'll need to get, be better at having access to our own data in our own hospital first to be able to analyze historical data, but we need to think, to start thinking now about how will, you will combine the data from the different institutions via distributed learning networks, actually. We'll keep the data in the hospitals, basically. It's gonna stay in McGill, it's gonna stay in, in PMH, but will we need to already build deep learning capacities, distributed learning, sorry, capacities to, uh, to, uh, to, to build models with many different hospitals together. Uh, the theoretical uh, ba uh, foundations of distributed learning and deep learning exist, obviously, but the capacities of research environments to do distributed learning and to collaborate together to build models uh, with, by keeping the data in everyone's hospitals is not there yet, and I think we have to start working on this now. Well, these are challenges for building the models, but if we want to have a real impact, we need to make sure that the models can make their way from our computers to the field, like to the, oh, yeah. To, to, yeah, to where they need to be applied. And to, to do that, we need <coughs> infrastructures to make sure that they can be deployed safely. That if those models keep evolving and they, they keep eating more and more data, that this is never gonna lead to a model that we thought was safe in the beginning, but because it ingested something weird, now it's broken and it's gonna diverge and become very bad. And I think before we have those tools that can make sure that a model keeps evolving safely and that we understand why it is making some decisions and we have a way to, yeah, to ensure that if it is going to, make, to do something really bad that we can catch it before it happens, then it's gonna be really hard to convince people to deploy those tools. Okay, well, we're at, I have three more questions, but I guess I don't have to ask them. But maybe very quickly, how many people are actually working with medical doctors right now? Okay. So again, to people in the audience who are thinking working in medicine, that's a pretty good indication of how to make progress and become a CIFAR chair. Right. So I'm going to change now to get questions from the audience. We should have the mics more centrally located, shouldn't we? <clears throat> Um, great panel, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. My question is about evaluation. Uh, of course, we develop our alg algorithms on uh, observational data sets, most likely, and then um, ha ha there's a challenge of evaluating. Of course, the doctors and the healthcare system won't allow us to go implement our shining uh, algorithm on site and affect real patients. Um, so we got to come up with some, some way to evaluate it in order to give them some proofs um, that it will work uh, uh, on real people. So I would, like, I would appreciate your comments on the on evaluation. Thank you. So uh, I think it's not difficult to, a lot of times, to simulate what would happen in clinical practice, right? You just prospectively divide your training and test set into the test set, which is, which is prospective in, in the past, um, right? So this is what we do. We do this all the time. We, uh, for predictive models especially, we, um, we have a, a cohort or whatever a set of medical records and we just uh, train it on whatever it was, um, you know, some time ago and predict on something more recent. Um, 
And I think a bigger question in, in what you're asking, it's not just that we build a model, we evaluate it, but it's more about which question we were answering in the first place. And it seems that even clinicians with who I work with, when they come to us and they ask a question and I say, okay, well, would you implement, if we solve this question to some extent, would you implement it in practice? And they say, well, no. And I say, okay, which, which question should we be solving so that it would actually have an impact in clinical practice? And then they change the question. And I think it's very, very important um, to be aware of that upfront, that even clinical questions, the people who are clinicians, when they talk to researchers and the questions they're interested from a research perspective are very different to the one in clinical practice. Yeah, please. I would like to emphasize this very briefly. I think there are very different notions of validation in different communities of data analysis. Uh, uh, so the machine learning community has this trained test and so on perspective. But what they call out of sample validation is not necessarily this exact same notion uh, in genetics, for example. And classical statistics may also have some diver diverging notions. So I think uh, it's important to be aware of this in the first place. And then as a practical way forward, I think uh, the machine learning community has um, kind of set a good example and can serve as a role model because the early established reference data sets like MNIST and so on that allow to, to compare against a standard and I think the medical community could really profit from this uh, direction. Let me a quick comment about the earlier question. I think part of the issue was observational versus RCT data that you may have never seen any examples of applying this medication to this class of patients. So I think that was the main thrust of the question but your answers are also talking about validation which is very, very relevant. Just quick refinement, but yes. Uh, just a quick comment about uh, metrics and so on. We implicitly assume that most of machine learning, again, is happening in the classical statistical learning setting of having a data set and training a model and testing that model. So it's all fixed. There is no temporal aspect. And in practice, again, depends which medical practice, but say I'm talking about say, automated generation of dialogue and applications to therapy. For example, depression, we recently had that AAA paper out, I mean, accepted. But anyway, just one example, there are many others. It's very difficult to evaluate the quality of uh, machine learning output immediately. It's really, if you think about it, it's reinforcement learning problem, reward is very ill-defined, not immediate because the outcome of treatment um, is hard to judge and may not happen immediately. And yet you have to generate dialogue on the spot. So I think it's not always even possible to wait for the practitioners in the field to tell you what the right metric is because they don't always know themselves. You may need to help them define it. It's just like uh, by analogy with totally other field, like good old times when Steve Jobs was saying that, don't ask customers what they want. You design it, you show it to them, and they will like it. Same thing. Okay. I, I, just, I just want to add to what you were saying. Um, again, just to reemphasize that it's important while we develop our methods that we have continuous feedback okay. from the clinicians and the end users. So again, this could be clinicians or it could also be companies that are willing to deploy this. And they often are more strict in terms of errors and, and because they want to sell products so in the medical industry. So it's important we met with our clinician every, every month and students had to present to the point mm -hmm. that clinicians were saying, well, wait a minute, show me that loss function again. You know, they were becoming much more familiar with, with machine learning and we were becoming familiar yes. with their needs. And Very I think familiar. that's what needs to happen. Okay. Um, I just want to comment on the RCT aspect yeah. of this. So there is a current understanding in a lot of kind of machine learning for healthcare among the people who are implementing it is that RCT is not going to be the way to go for evaluating these models. Um, what we are thinking of now, again, in a predictive uh, uh, modeling setting, is uh, that you start with silent trials. First, you do the retrospective on the yes. uh, already existing data. Then um, we do this, this kind of silent trial where um, it, the model can run in the background to whatever extent it can 
and it will be recorded what the output of the model is, and in parallel, a clinician will be recording a similar type of outcome, whatever was agreed upon, and then the comparison will be evaluated prospectively, but without affecting clinical practice. So uh, the sepsis system that was implemented at Hopkins, they did this. Uh, sepsis system that was implemented at um, uh, Duke, they did this. Uh, at Stanford, they are doing the same thing. So this is, this is one of the ways uh, kind of a natural progression of what happens now, and after the silent trial, they're actually implementing it in practice. Yeah. Good. More conversation later. Two more people, I guess. Who is next? I guess. I'll go. Alexandre oh, okay. Boutillier. Please. I'm the co-founder of Imagia and board member at Emila. I know we've talked a lot about uh, explainability or interpretability today. I want to uh, know a little bit more about your interest in those fields and maybe differentiate if you think there will be some difference between explainability f from a theoretical perspective through the regulatory agencies and maybe to the doctor that only have like few seconds or a second to assess whether or not the machine tells the truth. And maybe a subsection to that, what happens when it's not in the medical images or other type of data, how, how can you provide um, explainability? Okay. Nice, easy question. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we're working a lot on uncertainty for those reasons. Um, we are working on uh, models that will tell the clinician, I have confidence, for example, that there's a lesion here, or this is the tumor boundary, or I don't. And there are ways to evaluate that. This is still um, ongoing research, so I, I think that it is, in fact, important um, in terms of, of pr giving the clinician that information. Um, if you meant also interpretability, which is different than, I guess, explainability, we're also, and, and I think as a field, we're starting to really look at interpretability as, as an important issue. For example, when you have diseases that are not well understood and you can get, um, and then you can predict something, for example, this person will survive, um, you know, a certain amount of months or uh, the disease will progress and then you would like to open up the black box. So there's quite a bit of new research coming out saying, okay, what was the network looking at when it made that prediction? And not just when it made that prediction, but when it made it with confidence. Or, um, and so there's a lot of interest in that because then you can go back to the clinician and say, hey, over the population, it seems the deep learning model kept looking at these areas and then people can work together to understand disease evolution uh, a lot more. But again, this is a work, this is very recent uh, research and I think that's where also we need um, the machine learning community to weigh in. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a very tough question, um, uh, very far from having an answer, but I think it's an interesting fun fact to consider that even if you take like a linear model, a generalized linear model uh, that we know and love and use in evidence-based medicine in the 20th century, if you add enough input variables, it's easy to argue that this is also losing its interpretability at some point. Mm -hmm. In the uh, Lesu case that Arena uh, um, mentioned, for example, in the high noise scenario, high correlatedness scenario, uh, interpretability is even gone in the linear model regime. So, um, and then I think, uh, it kind of, for me personally, becomes kind of a semantic question again. I think we probably have to relax or alter our notion of interpretability or explainability that we want to impose on these models. And uh, I think practically right now, for me, the question is, is you, if you have a complicated deep net with multiple nonlinear layers and you perturb an input variable C, do you still get the same prediction accuracy? And then you go through all the input variables. If you kind of uh, tisney the output, or if you use things like sharp lime, whatever, uh, to kind of get linear approximations to the body of this thing. Of course, that does not tell you exactly exhaustively what that system did, but the question is, is that perhaps a sufficient practically useful notion of uh, uh, explainability that is sufficient for what stakeholders and policymakers yeah. want? I think that's a useful question. You can always ask the question of how interpretable is the clinician's inter <laughs> description, exactly. which is another question. That's but, a good sorry. question. Okay. Uh, maybe one more comment, because there's uh, two more people. Uh, uh, one more comment, and then we'll have other people. To do you want to have a comment you want to say? Uh, I just, I just okay. wanted to say that we actually to. did a survey of clinicians uh, about what they would like okay. to see in the model. And um, uh, we have that paper on archive if you are interested. But uh, it was very interesting to us that different clinicians at different stages of their practice, they wanted different things. So, for example, junior clinicians wanted a validation that um, what, what they have decided 
is kind of the right thing to do. The older clinicians could not care less if the system identified the same thing. They said, I already know it, this is boring, why are you wasting my time? Yes. Um, they said, what we want to know is that if the system disagrees, it should provide evidence to why it disagreed. And again, I completely agree that one of the, one of the things that we started looking at uh, was, uh, okay, so how would it act in different situations? The same as training, you know, the complicated machines that they're using for MRI right now. They don't understand exactly yeah. how these machines work and the physics behind them. But um, this, is, this is something that uh, they actually did. And so we started building counterfactual models to, yes. to show, um, to try to explain why the system made uh, certain decisions, and I think that, that went a lot better. And I want to mention a paper by uh, Hannah Wallach, with, uh, by her group, it's a big group yeah. of people, that uh, shows that people um, with in models that are simpler, they tend to trust them too much. So too much, right. when they um, use these models, they, they're able to um, kind of predict what this uh, model would do. But at the end of the day, when a model makes an error, they're blind to it as well because they trust it too much. And that um, using oversimplified models is actually dangerous in yeah. practice. I think maybe we okay. should, we are oh, very patient, perhaps we maybe this. Just... So, um, going back to the um, issue with data, the qu quantity of data was discussed, um, but what about data sharing? Uh, so, in healthcare applications, we have things like patient confidentiality, um, and it's not like other applications where it's pictures of trees and cars and so on, so we're dealing with patient information. And uh, what I find is that um, a lot of institutions, they have their own data sets, but there's not that much uh, data sharing so that we can compare models using the same data set. So um, how is that <coughs> to be dealt with? So maybe two quick comments, because you were two. I just want to reemphasize the point of, I think, we can overcome that with distributed learning. Uh, if we get let the data at each one's hospital, we don't will not have to, to to share it basically. But we will learn by sending the training applications from one hospital to the other. Uh, I think this is very important. And if I can also jump to the the, the, the question previous question about evaluation. Um, Maybe we should do distributed learning applications like this, training from uh, to each other's hospital by keeping it there. But then also uh, with, I don't know, with 3, 10, 20, 100 hospitals, I don't know. We need to find that sweet spot, first of all, because uh, patients are different in USA than in Europe. Uh, we all, so what's that sweet spot? We need to find it. And I think in any case, we will always need to fine tune one model to a local population or a local uh, hospital. It's also worth being aware of issues like batch effects, covariate shift, and domain drift on top of every top of privacy issues. Any final comments? I mean, having worked in the medical system for a number of years, um, I would not expect that uh, there's a massive culture shift in the next five years, and every medical doctor is happy to share all the data that was very hard to acquire. <coughs> I think that's very hard, and at the same time, there are also reasonable um, ethical like, questions. This is sensitive information, and we just need a, a very strong regul regulation around those. So I think uh, kind of workarounds like aggregate statistics per site, this is becoming a standard in genetics, yeah. a d-score regression, three nature genetics papers in 2015. This is really taking off. Nobody needs to share the original data. Decentralized model fitting uh, is taking off. So I think these solutions are workarounds we need to expand on those because I think we can't expect uh, boundless data sharing with sensitive patient data. I think that's unreasonable to ask. Although it is interesting that in the genetics community, things like microarray data was universally shared, but that's, but maybe that's no patient identity. I just violated my claim. I was going to stop at this point. But I Okay. 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 So I just want to comment that I completely agree that the future is probably behind the federated uh, learning, and but we are in one of these projects now. It's incredibly uh, intensive in terms of resources because the infrastructure is different in different places. So it's us and three other hospitals in the U.S. and. Um, they don't have the same infrastructure, so it's very intense on people, it's intense on like building uh, infrastructure. It's in, we, we need a clinician and a machine learning person in both places to make sure that they install things properly. And it's just, I think, uh, 
it was brought up before that infrastructure and building that up is going to really enable. Uh, oh, definitely. This, this kind of definitely. Oh, and maybe one more thing. I'm a quick ad. I'm looking for a postdoc to, to survival prediction. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good luck, Russ. Okay. <laughs>